Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, episode number 62. I am Dr. David C. Noe, here in the Vomitorium with my good friend and co-host, a learned fellow, Dr. Jeffrey T. Winkle. How are you this evening, Jeff? I'm feeling good. I'm feeling relaxed. I'm excited to get down to it today. You got your Clyde's drive-in t-shirt on? Okay, yep, and I'm wearing my, my, my comfy lounge pants. You're lounging yes, exactly. in the Vomitorium. If, if anything, the problem might be I'm too relaxed. You? Too yes. relaxed? Yes. Who's on cleanup this evening? Uh, that would uh, That's you. That's me. That's you, yeah. All right. But uh, you're looking formal tonight. I, well, I had some other work to do before uh, podcasting. So no no chance to change into your loungewear. No, no way. No. Right. What is my loungewear? I don't know. Do you have loungewear at a, home? A looser necktie. <laughs> like that's what it is. Yeah. yeah. A coat with fewer pockets. <laughs> right. Something right. like that. Yeah. Do we have a shout out tonight? We do. This goes to uh, a Mr. Nico Vazdaris. Yes, correct. This is the third week of international shout out. That's huge. It is. Yeah. Can I read this? Because I love this. Go for it. All right. My name is Nico Vazdaris. Oh, I shouldn't be doing some kind of accent. <laughs> I've never met the guy. Right. Sorry. Let's start over. He'll correct us, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. We've gotten some of those, Ron. My name is Nico Vazdaris, and I am from Germany. I study classical philology and German literature in Innsbruck, Austria. Unfortunately, classical philology keeps on losing its prestige due to the fact that more and more schools tend to take Latin and Greek out of the syllabus. So this is happening in Austria, too. Yeah, and Nico is on a rant, and I love it. Yeah. So let's let him keep going. I appreciate, he says, every action that is taken not only to promote this fundamental and stellar subject, but also every person who is interested in learning this subject, as well as every person who is teaching it. That's gold. That's gold. I love it. Thanks, Nico. You want to continue on from there? Yes. Yeah, so he says uh, he was doing research on Lucretius and his proemium. Pro- proemium? Proemium. Proemium. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the contradiction and why he's addressing Venus there. So because I wanted to learn more about Lucretius, not only by reading books, I typed in podcast and Lucretius on YouTube. I mean, that's got to be that's got to be a hand picked number of people who have typed those two words into the... In the whole world. In in the YouTube search box. Yes, you're right. right. Lucretius Podcast. But in doing so, he He found us. He found us. (laughs) (laughs) He says, I couldn't believe that there was a podcast not only about him, but about classics in general. And since then, I have started to listen to your amazing podcast just right from the beginning. I wanted to thank you, uh, really, ab imo pectore. From the bottom bottom of of his heart. heart, Ab imo pectore. Uh, For giving everyone this opportunity to dive into another world full of fun news and interesting facts about the world of classics. Thank you so much, Nico. Yeah. We just love that encouragement and uh, your enthusiasm yeah. for the same subjects that we love. And uh, you're keeping the flame lit, the torch uh, aloft out there. Yes. I'm, Innsbruck, I think there was there was a Winter Olympics held there once. I've been picturing Nico like high up on, like halfway up an Alp. <laughs> Do you watch the Winter Olympics? I, I, like, this, I like some of the skiing and stuff. Really? Right? I know you love the ice dancing. Oh, you can't yeah. get enough of that. Yeah, yeah that's me. <laughs> Uh, this the what is it the uh, the slob bedding what is that Sla- bob sledding bob sledding right. sorry right now there's some good stuff there okay All right All right but uh, yeah thanks again Nico uh, incredible yeah uh, keep the flame alive in in Austria All right Jeff so what are we giving our listeners on this particular episode we're talking about uh, the neoclassical movement this, okay this Greek revival movement that happened in the late 18th uh, early 19th century. Um, in literature, art, and music, uh, and especially art and architecture. 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 Yeah. Right? And we're gonna, so we're going to set that up and talk about that movement and give some examples of, of what was going on, and then talk more specifically about its influence on some of the monuments uh, you can see in Washington, D.C. Here in the federal capital. Yes. Yep. Good and, stuff. And that's stuff. located right in the middle of the country, right? In a, a centrally located place where all the states can contribute and be a part of what's happening? Uh, no, not not at all. No? No. <laughs> it's kind of, sort of, halfway up the East Coast. Okay. Yeah. It was a kind of a trade, if I'm not uh, mistaken. The federal capital would be in Virginia, mm-hmm. and that was a concession to the Virginians who didn't want to ratify the Constitution, many of them. And they thought, well, if we put it down here close to us in this swamp, then those New Englanders aren't going to run roughshod over us. So it was Virginians kind of wanting to... Keep, uh, keep an eye on keep things. Keep an eye on things. Gotcha. Right, right. And people and who cheer for the Boston Red Sox, can they be trusted with the federal government? No, not at all. I don't think so. No, but more so than Yankee fans, don't you think? 
Yes, but the Yankees aren't in Virginia. No, but you brought the Red Sox. I couldn't help but think about the Yankees. I I think we're both lost. (laughs) Back to the subject. Yes. Right. So um, uh, I have an opening quote. Let's hear it. Can I, yeah, so this comes from a certain Thomas Broomball writing back in 1960. This is uh, Thomas Broomball? Broomball. 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 Um, and from an article that he wrote entitled A Defense of Neoclassicism in America. He writes, the neoclassic world was one of revolution and change, yet a surprisingly large number of artists of the century from 1750 to 1850 looked to symbols of permanence, the ideal and the absolute, as means by which to express themselves and their age. It seems today a paradox that their incentive to this classic art was found in broken fragments of dead Greece and Rome. Because while making a dynamic and integral literary or artistic work is difficult under any circumstances, envisioning it as they did within the husk of the style of another time made the difficulties involved almost insuperable. Self-conscious devotion to an ancient civilization and its style led these artists in some cases to archaeology, pedantry, and academicism, and others to an excuse for a romantic and sometimes effusive extension of themselves. It also led uh, much conservative and official artistic taste in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to a point of view which appears to be a fusion of both romantic and classic elements, a hybrid which is romantic classic. It should, of course, be recognized that any revival, and especially a classic one, is by its very nature a romantic activity. Mm, Interesting. So I like this quote because I think he gets at a lot of the... Uh, inherent paradoxes and tensions within this classic revival, mm-hmm. right? There, there's kind of a, a move towards simplicity, but there's also kind of this move towards um, kind of an, an airiness and a, and a mystery. And an, right. um, the unresolvedness of it is kind of the point. Mm-hmm. Those two things kind of hold together in this in this interesting tension. Right. I'm fascinated by this particular sentence, self-conscious devotion to an ancient civilization. So I really love the Greeks and the Romans, they said, the architects, and they're self-consciously devoted to it. Uh to an ancient civilization and its style led these artists in some cases to archaeology, pedantry, and academicism, and in others to an excuse for a romantic and sometimes effusive extension of themselves. That's really interesting. So devotion to the ancient civilizations became a reason just to do what they wanted Mm -hmm. and uh, extend their own romantic vision. Right. It, It becomes kind of a uh, a, a kind of a blank canvas which you can project your own ideals or you you filter your own ideals through this this the mythic grandeur of, of Greece and Rome and that can mm-hmm. be many many different kinds of things right. right I think this is a common this is the source of a common complaint that I hear from classicists professional classicists like ourselves when they are um, surveying popular appropriations of the classics hmm. right so it's not the case that all of Rome was marble temples. Right. It's not the case that all of Rome was monochromatic, as we'll talk about later. Right. In fact, it was a riot of color and noise and mess. Yes. Uh, like any other uh, world city. Right. But if you talk about something that's classical, you want nice stately columns looking more like a museum display than a place where people actually lived. Right. And so I think that's the romanticism that Brumbaugh is capturing in this quote. Uh, this is just to kind of build on what you were just saying. He's getting at this this thing that most contemporary knowledge or conventional knowledge about the ancient world is not filtered through the ancients themselves. It's through things like the neoclassical movement, right? Because the way that uh, a temple should look, the way that um, uh, a column should look, the, the colors of these things are, they, they don't go back to knowledge of from 2,500 years ago. They come filtered through this idealization of this other culture. So, right. So it's a it's through a glass darkly. All right. So then as we get into it, we're mm-hmm. going to give the listeners a broad overview of neoclassicism from a, about 1750 to 1850. Yep. And then we're going to focus specifically on its architectural expression within Washington, D.C. That's exactly right. All right. So let's get right into it. All right. So when we talk about neoclassicism, I think when people hear that term, if they're familiar with the term, I think they, they mostly think of it in terms of kind of this architectural Greek revival. Um, but there's a lot more going on uh, than simply just that. So some have defined neoclassicism. Why does it come about? Why this revival in the late 18th century? Many art historians have pointed to the fact that it's a it's a reaction against to uh, reaction against the art form that of, uh, kind of late Baroque or Rococo art, which had become over detailed, uh, asymmetrical, a little bit too too wild, florid. Right? Florid, exactly right. So, and I have to admit that the Baroque style of decoration is, is amongst my least favorite. Yes, mine too. Yeah, probably because um, I've drawn to that more that simple classical style. Mm-hmm. So clean lines. Yes. Uh, of the 
the three orders, right? The Doric, the uh, Ionic, and Corinthian. Which one do you favor? I favor the Ionic. Really? I do. Because yeah. that's the midpoint, right? The midpoint, right? So the Doric has no scrolls. The the shaft of the column terminates directly into the stylobate. There's nothing on the bottom, no pediment or anything. Right. Uh, the Ionic has a little bit of decoration. It's got the volute at the top, the scroll. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, but you don't like the Corinthian with the carved pomegranates and the acanthus leaves and the. It's impressive. It's just it's it's again for me it's kind of it's leaning leaning a little bit baroque. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit too much. I mean, I'm 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 fine with it. I don't really have strong feelings about uh, about these one way or the other. But if I had to pick one. I'd pick the Ionic because mm -hmm. it kind of, it's, again, it strikes that middle ground. It's what about the golden you? mean. What about you? I like the severity of the Doric. Just that, just that pure simplicity. Stark, yeah, right. I like that. Very it, drawn to that. It's the Parthenon, right? Mm -hmm. the, the Doric temple, and um, I know I, I get that too. It's just I, th I think it's that column that just kind of finishes right into the foundation that that disturbs you. Disturbs you. Where's I, the base? I need, I need a little. I need a base <laughs> there. Right. It looks like something's missing. Hmm. Yeah. So. Um, it's a pushback against kind of this this wildness, and so it's kind of a return to uh, simple geometric forms in a way. And this, um, I like this. This um, this is kind of part of this larger argument that you can almost see this as a pattern throughout history. If you compare this to, if you compare the archaic to the classical to the Hellenistic period, I see. you see a similar kind of thing. The archaic period, very you know. Thick, heavy, but very simple. Mm -hmm. The classical period takes those same shapes, but um, makes them refined. Refined, yeah. And by the time you get to the Hellenistic period, you have kind of these. You think of like the um, the Laocoon statue, yep. right? This kind of wild um, hyper realism. Mm -hmm. There's that that altar of Zeus that's now in the that Berlin Museum, where you have the figures that are like the coming Pergamon altar, yeah, exactly right. coming off the the wall and climbing the stairs. Mm -hmm. So again, the Hellenistic period kind of takes things to kind of a uh, an exaggeration, and that means culture is going to say, "Whoa, slow down. Let's mm -hmm. let's start from the beginning." Yeah. So I think about these things primarily in terms of statuary, also. Mm -hmm. So we're headed to architecture, but we're talking about statuary, right? So I I think of the archaic kuros, right? The Sunion kuros with yeah. the, the legs that are not entirely parallel, the the hips and the torso. There's more. There's less tension there than a person would have in that posture. Mm -hmm. Everything is a kind of rigid symmetry with the incised lines on the uh, abs and so forth. Very Egyptian. Right. Powerful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Powerful, but nothing really human about it. It's a type. Exactly. It looks robotic. Correct. And mm -hmm. then we get to, you know, Polyclitus and the the the, the spear thrower the or the spear carrier, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the Deriferos. And now you have a real um, human being, although they're physique and the level of perfection physically is still beyond anything anyone could accomplish. Right, right. Presumably, but um, <clears throat> at least if I keep eating potato chips, but <laughs> it's per it's nearly perfect. <laughs> yes. But then the Hellenistic, you've got uh, statuary like the old boxer. Yeah. Right. Where you see all the wounds and, right. the, and the cuts and the creases. Right. right. And so it's still physically magnificent, but it's not the apex of, of human physical accomplishment. Right. And so you're saying that we're seeing, this is, isn't this kind of a Hegelian explanation of a cyclical look at artistic expression? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Right. Or um, in broader terms, or put it like in Nietzschean terms, uh, history kind of fluctuates between Apollonian and Dionysian periods. Right. Okay. And I think you could, you could relate to that, that same kind of thing. So a, a kind of a return to classicism is a kind of a move away from the Dionysian to the Apollonian, mm -hmm. or from, away from wild nature to to civilization. So, which which are we in now in uh, twenty twenty one? I think we're I think we are careening towards uh, careening through a Dionysian phase. So, what's coming next? Well, a, a return to some strict formality of some kind. I think so. I mean, if the if that pattern holds. Speaking in aesthetic terms, right? These these are not moral terms, right? Although the movements are. Presumably not entirely disconnected. No, no. I, 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 like I said, like in neoclassics, if you if you look at this as it applies to literature and, and art and, and music, I mean, these things are not far from culture. Not they, I mean, no. they're imbued with morality, right? Right. So I think these things tend to follow one another. But I mean, this is not to kind of to to I think to use this as kind of your your magic eight ball to kind of see where um, you know this is what's ha going to happen in the future. But there are patterns here, mm -hmm. and I think cultures kind of go through these these waves, and 
um, they build up and then they they go through you know peaks and valleys and they they push forward and push back. Hmm. So who were some of the um, individuals that uh, aided in this romantic rediscovery of ancient Greece and Rome? Right. So if you if you're not thinking of architecture. Um, uh, you're often thinking of kind of the romantic poets, these English poets in particular, who are coming down to to Italy and to Greece and finding kind of a tragic, haunting beauty, a kind of memento mori mm-hmm. in the crumbling ruins of the Colosseum and the Parthenon. Which is, don't forget to die. Yes. Right? Remember death. Remember death, mm-hmm. right? And so guys like uh, John Keats and Percy Shelley and, and Lord Byron. Wh- whom everybody knows, if I may interrupt, carved his name into the column. At uh, Sunian. Sunian, the Temple of Poseidon. Yes, it's Byron, right out there, right? Mm-hmm. You can still see it there. Um, incredible. Incredible. But um, so these guys are, they're writing this poetry and, and sending it back home. And, and um, Byron in particular is having, you know, he's, these, are, these are smash hits mm-hmm. back home. And um, this makes people uh, want to go see them. Mm-hmm. And so you have the, the wealthy youths of Northern Europe going on these grand tours before, right. they, before they take up public office or you know, they, law practice or whatever, and they're going to visit these places. And that's just feeding this, this kind of frenzy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And not only that, but they're bringing little bits of it home. So right. about three or four years ago, I don't remember when it was, but I learned a brand new word that has fascinated me ever since. And that is on a British estate... Sometimes during this time period, they would recreate a miniature, kind of like Hadrian's villa, you know, the Disney world of the ancient world. Right. They would recreate some element of classical architecture in miniature on their estate, and it was called a folly. How do you, how do you spell that? F-O-L-L-Y? Yeah. A folly. Okay. A folly. So, you know, a small arch, a little loggia, something like that. This is a, called a folly. Okay. And this is at this very same time period? I think this is the time period. So it's an architectural adornment within a natural landscape. It's not intended to be practical. It's decorative, and uh, it's called a folly. Very interesting. So in this moment of neoclassicism, there's a lot of other things going on at the same time. And so in addition to um, this architectural revival and the poetry from you know, Keats and Byron and the like, uh, archaeology is starting to um, solidify as an actual science. Right, right, because of the discovery of Pompeii. Pompeii is a huge catalyst for mm-hmm. this, right? And um, we, uh, you know, ages ago we had an episode on, on Schliemann. You know, so Schliemann's... He, Who? Uh, Who are you talking about? Heinrich Schliemann. 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 Did that one have a clever title? I think it was just Schliemann. Schliemann. You were supposed to hear it and read it like like Schwarzenegger. I see. That's the, that was the hook of it. But, okay. Um, he's born in the, in the early 19th century, and of course, you know, he makes his mark on the history of archaeology. So invents it pretty much. Right. So you have the the poets kind of celebrating the tragic beauty of these crumbling ruins. You have archaeologists coming to study and preserve them. Um, you also have kind of the ideas uh, and the philosophies of, of Greece and Rome um, feeding the Age of Enlightenment. And so um, you know, the the various classical thinkers, we did, why did we did a show on this too, right? On what? Uh, th- their, their influence on the Founding Fathers. Oh, right? yes. And it so... Was so. Father's Foundings. Yes, Father's Foundings. It's getting a little too, what's the term here? Self-referential. Right, we better, we better cut we it. We better tone this down. Okay, that's right. So if we, if we have a reference to a previous episode uh, by accident, we just won't call attention to it. Okay. All right. We won't, for example, call attention to number 32, <laughs> the greatest clunker of all time. <laughs> There's no need to bring this up. From the, the Odyssey, right? It was one of the endless... Odyssey episodes right. we did. Yes, exactly. I think, that, I think the title that's, that one of us came up with, and it wasn't I, <laughs> let's just say that, was take a gander at this dream I had. <laughs> You're blaming me. You think it's the title that scared hey, people away. Hey, you got to blame somebody. All right, all right. The needle on that one hasn't moved in weeks. I know, exactly. Is this your passive aggressive way of trying to get people to go and actually no, bump those no, numbers No, no, I'm up? about to phone my cousin and say, here's five bucks, download this. <laughs> please, please listen right. to it. Right. Take a gander at this dream I had. All right, okay, yes. Clearly Dave has issues that we need to discuss off air. Anyway, all kinds of stuff going on. And so the, the, the Founding Fathers rediscovering or you know, tapping into the, the thought of the ancients right. as they kind of put together um, the ideals of the American Revolution and the, and the writing of the Constitution. So all of this stuff is, is happening during this neoclassical movement. And the collecting of antiquities becomes popular. Yes, right, uh, which is a lot of which is um, very controversial today. Winkle, do you have any antiquities in your home? Like genuine antiquities? Oh, yeah. No, no, none. Okay. No. I have a, a replica or two. But, All right. Uh, what about you? Well, let's talk about your replicas first. Okay. 
I have a replica of the um, my favorite face painting of Ajax and Achilles playing dice. Or oh, playing, that's a good playing one. Some kind of game. Yeah. It's Exequius, I think. Isn't yes, it, it is Exequius. Yeah, right. So, and I have some um, fake Athenian coins, fifth century Athenian coins mm-hmm. that I, I like to use as visual aids in classes I teach. But I really don't have, I don't, I don't have any actual antiquity. So it's an Athenian owl, right? Yeah, yeah, the bubo. Right. So a fake owl would be a, a fowl. Yes, I yes, suppose. a fake owl. Yes, a fowl. Right. I have a bag of fowls in my <laughs> office. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I have a couple coins that are authentic. Okay. Uh, but then I have reproductions too. Right. I have uh, some black vase wear, a nice one with Hercules. But where I'm going with this is I have a plaster of Paris um, column, an ionic column, a half column. Uh-huh. And I like it, even though it's not by any stretch of the imagination remotely like what it's supposed to represent. Is it? How does? It, is it a paperweight? What are we talking about? No, it's about three feet high. Oh, that's a that's a pretty big paperweight. <laughs> <laughs> the wind just comes sweeping, sweeping through my office. Yeah, where are you working? In the back of a flatbed truck, right? <laughs> this was that's, just decorative. He, he's quoting Seinfeld, ladies and gentlemen. Is that there. what that was? Yes. Oh my gosh, it's so embedded in in, in my DNA that I don't realize that it, that that's what I'm quoting from. But thank you for sourcing that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so where, now, where did you get this this weird three foot column? It was a gift from a uh, family member. I don't remember exactly. Okay. Hope they're not listening. I think I do remember, but it was kind of a gift to celebrate um, the successful defense of my PhD. So, oh, nice, nice. And I love it. You put plants on it, all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. And it's so reminiscent of the classical world that that's all that matters. Right. I have in my office. Um, it's a pencil holder. It's a, it's a bust of Julius Caesar. Oh, right. All the pencils go right in, in, into his back. Right. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> not impressed by this. No, I'm not, really. <laughs> I think it's a nice joke. They have a tiny little trash can manufactured by the Brute Company. Yes. You know that? No. Right. And every time I look at it, I think, et tu, Brute? Uh, every time. Right. Because it's, it's Brute, <laughs> right? But if I give it a Latin pronunciation. Right. Brute. Et tu, Brute? brute. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. But I, I'm, you know, I'm glad that you don't have... I mean, the coins that you have, I'm get, did you get those off eBay or something? Hey, you're like very nosy, aren't you? I am a little nosy. <clears throat> yeah. uh, they're both from Rome. I purchased them when I was in okay. Rome. Right, but you're, you're not lifting them off. Oh, no, 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 no. Right. These are of uh, well-established provenance right. with certification and everything. They weren't moved around illegally. Right. Speaking of which, Lord Elgin. Oh, we're getting around to this guy. Yes, we have to touch on him briefly because he's from this time period. Now he has a long name. His name is Thomas Bruce, the seventh Earl of Elgin and the eleventh Earl of King Cardine. But you can double up your earldom. <laughs> yes, you can. I had no idea. Right. So, <laughs> does it make you want an earl? <laughs> it does. <make> <laughs> <laughs> All right, so he's a double earl. Right. Right. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> so you had to wonder how this happened, right? <laughs> right. I see your earl. Yeah. yeah. I raise you another. I raise earl. another earl. Right. Uh, do you happen to know how he got to be? Two time Earl, two different <laughs> times, seventh and eleventh, right? No, I don't. Right. They're of different places. It had to be a kind of inheritance. Yeah. Someone left him the earldom of King Cardine, and he already had the earldom of Elgin. And he said, "I'll take it. I'll take an earl." Yeah, yeah. If you're if you're offering it, I'll take it. Right. right. I, I wouldn't turn down a an, an earl. No, I I wouldn't either. Earlship. Right. 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 I've taken the earl flight sometimes. <laughs> taken an earl train. So you're well acquainted with all things earl. Now, I was thinking uh, when we were putting this episode together, this guy deserves his own episode. Definitely his story, right? Yes. Lord Elgin. But we don't have a lot of listeners in Greece. And if we deal with Lord Elgin, that problem will only worsen. Oh, I know, but I think it's an important story. Because they hate him. I know they do. With a passion. Right. And, and you're on their side. I am mostly 100%. on their side. 100%. I, I, 95. 95. Um but see, already kind of the, the heatedness says that would make a good episode. Right? I guess. I'm I'm on their side, but not 100%. All right. Well, we should tell the audience who this guy is and, and why he's hated and, All right. and, and or, or Go loved. Go for it. Born in 1766? Yep. Died in 1841. He is most famous for uh, what he did to the Parthenon. Right. And so he was one of these collectors of antiquities um, with his double earl ships. He had... He had money. He mm-hmm. had um, the means to travel. He had titles. He had titles. Probably two passports. <laughs> At least two passports. Yeah, one for each earl- <laughs> earldom. And so he went around collecting antiquities to bring back home, not to put on display in museums, but to... Uh, not de- originally. No, well, you know, you know. Well, we'll get around to this detail. Okay. It was to decorate his house. Right. Right. And to um, to liven up his, 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 uh, his musty castle or wherever he's living mm-hmm. in... Uh, 
Elgin or Kim Kardashian. Kim, yeah, Kim, you you got it. Kim, Let's keep it, going. Kim Kardashian. <laughs> um, um, and so he takes this. He takes these these statues um, with which, the permission of the Turkish authorities. Yes, but we are talking about in an era before there are archaeological permits. Right. There's archaeologists today. If you're digging a site, you don't just box up whatever you find and take it no. home. It, so what you're suggesting right. is that we judge him by the standards of the early 21st century. I, I okay, that felt like a little bit of a zing. Definitely, there, right? and it hit its mark. <laughs> um, Rem aku tetegi. I think there are there are some things, you know, judgments that are eternal. We can't blame Lord Elgin for not following laws that that uh, weren't there. Right. But we can take him to task for being a greedy earl. Okay. All right. So what if they had stayed there? If they had stayed there, they'd probably be in the archaeological museum uh, of the uh, off the Acropolis today. Or potentially in a pile of rubble. Even worse rubble. Possibly. Possibly. All right. I see where you're going with this. Okay. Right. But we're getting sidetracked. Right. So he take he he takes lots of these marbles um, off of from around not just the Parthenon. He, he collected stuff from a, um, a lot of different areas. Right. Of Greece. Uh, put, put them in carts. Put them in ships. Boated them back. Boated them back. And one of those ships sank. So there's a, a lot of the stuff that he that he plucked is now at the bottom of the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. And to decorate his house. And then he uh, eventually he runs into financial trouble and to get himself out of debt. He sells the Parthenon marbles to the British government, and uh, long story short, they found their way into the British Museum, where they are kind of to this day. To this day, and shall not be returned to the Greek people, according to the British government. Um, right, exactly. But you know, now that uh, a lot of that that argument rested upon the fact that uh, you know, the Brits would would look at the Athens and say, "Look at that museum you have, kind of that dingy, crappy museum on top mm-hmm. of the Acropolis," and um, so. Here they can be displayed these, beautifully. These are priceless works that belong to the world, the world, not right. to Greece. Right. Uh, but now the Greeks have this this beautiful state of the art museum uh, that opened about ten years ago, and they've got a big empty room there waiting for the return of these marbles. And um, I think they've got a case. Okay. I think well, got let's a case. because you're starting to make the case. Well, let's save it for another episode. <laughs> okay. So the point for this episode, he's one of these guys, one of many that were. Uh, had kind of the Greek, the, the Greco-Roman mania. Yeah, they were bitten by the bug. They're bitten by the bug, and they wanted to, he wanted to bring it back home and build some follies. Mm-hmm, the right? neoclassicism. Let's talk about Jacques Louis David. Well, why should we talk about him? Because he's a famous painter of the same time period, roughly 1748, 1825. Yeah. Without uh, his paintings, it would be much more difficult to illustrate many of the stories from classical myth, particularly the Roman side. Right, right, right. I, I think uh, looking at his paintings too, I think he's. Uh, in many ways, largely responsible for that kind of the, the mythic idealism of ancient Greece and Rome, which I think is still kind of part of a, a contemporary um, notion. Definitely. I mean, I mean, a lot of that stuff of, of you know, how Greece and Rome are, are generally thought of by the populace is filtered through the kind of imagery that uh, Jacques-Louis de right. David Heroic, used. Yep. masculine, stoic. Stoic. Um, and even in terms of when he paints uh, like architecture and landscape, it's exaggerated. It, right. it's, um, the the um, the natural areas are wild and craggy and mm-hmm. rocky and mountainous. Although, if you've seen the um, his depiction of Alexander Paris, you know, in the boudoir of uh, Helen, oh, yeah, of yeah, Helen yeah. there's nothing particularly. I don't know, manly or strong about that. Right. Well, I, I mean, I guess I wouldn't expect that. No, it fits the it theme. It fits the theme. But it's, right. it's all soft. There's nothing bold about it. Right. So um, a, a, a few of his paintings we might refer to, and, and maybe we actually should put images of these up in the show notes um, uh, one of these days. Um, his painting, The Oath of the Horatii, uh, from 786, uh, is one of these, these paintings that's filled with kind of... Um, Roman masculinity. Mm-hmm. and um, So these three triplets, this is recorded by Livy, early legends of Rome. Uh, they take an oath, right, to fight to the death for the defense of Rome. Right. And so it becomes um, emblematic of um, a sacrifice, particularly masculine military sacrifice for, for patriotic ideals. Mm-hmm. Um, and this, again, this is how uh, kind of Roman militarism, I think, is, is idealized and, and, and thought of. Should we talk briefly about uh, his famous painting of the death of Socrates? Yeah, that's probably my favorite okay. of his. And so here we have, uh, it's a scene, I, I believe, from um, he's from the Critias, kind of the last moments of, of Socrates. The, the Crito, I think. Cri- sorry, Crito, right. Right. Um, 
and we get the death scene, the, the final moments of, of Socrates' life. He's in prison. His friends have kind of arranged that, hey, if you want to go into exile, you know, we can you can get out of here. We, right. We bought up the, the guards, but of course Socrates decides, no, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, uh, you know, leave my life in Athens by you know breaking these, right. these laws. That, I'm no Tim Robbins. Uh, Tim Robbins. Shawshank Redemption. Oh, oh, exactly. Right. right. So, oh. And that's another hot button for you. <laughs> it is. But we already talked about it. <laughs> that's right. We already talked about right. it. Right. So, um, and so we see him in this painting, kind of defiant to the last. He's got his, his finger up raised, raised. You know, he's literally giving death the finger, and his friends in confidence are are their heads are are bowed. Um, they're they're um, they're crying. They're pleading. They're turned away, with one exception. Um, who's who's the one exception? I think that's Plato. Oh, right, right. Sitting there staring uh, at his hero. Oh, yes. Right, right, right. Who is uh, erect. His posture is perfect. The heroic torso. I don't need to explain this again, do I? <laughs> no, no. no okay. you don't. No, no. Right. right. And he's looking up like... He's, he hasn't been eating any potato chips, let's say that. That's right. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Socrates here, age 70. The, the dude is cut. That's right. Right. It's, it's, <laughs> Insanity, P90X, one, two, and three. He does it all. So he wasn't just... Um, Badgering people in the marketplace, he was clearly doing like eight minute abs right. every eight minutes. Well, how is an artist <laughs> supposed to display power and precision and self discipline of the mental kind? Mm-hmm. I think that they display it uh, through bodily types. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, I'd bu- I'd buy that. I, I mean, we're not supposed. To, I, don't, we're, I don't think David meant us to take these images literally. No, no, in, imbued with this I- idealized metaphor. No, right? to, to quote uh, Juvenal, "Men sana and corpora sano," right. right? Healthy mind and a healthy body. Exactly. But um, all that be as, be that as it may, uh, Socrates looks like he looks like Apollo. Yes, right? definitely. Except for the hairline. Right. Um, but yeah, Plato's kind of gazing up at him, saying, "Like, I, I think I could build a career on this guy." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but it also strikes me too. He was starting to draft his own episode. <laughs> <laughs> what also I like about this this painting too is um, you've been to the purported prison cell. Yeah, the Desmoterion in in uh, the Agora. In the Agora, and it's mm-hmm. it's a the room where we were fairly sure Socrates spent his last moment is tiny. And the reason we know that is because there were unearthed a number of small figurines of Socrates yes. on that very spot. Like so, these, these votives. Correct. The idea was you come there, if you are a devotee of philosophy, you purchase a little clay figurine of Socrates and you lay it in the spot where he died right. in his honor. Right. And not only that, they found these little vials of um, which contained hemlock. Right. Yep. So it was a common prison spot. Right. And But the room is... Found, found some old slippers, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Right, Socrates' final slippers. Right, some uh, some issues of popular mechanics. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> but I was wondering where you were going to go with that. <laughs> what would a philosopher's slippers be like? Tattered rags, and they probably smell. Right? Yeah, smell really bad. Wash your feet already, Socrates. Exactly. But it's a tiny room. It's a phone booth, mm-hmm. and uh, of course, the, the the prison cell that David imagines is, is this massive. Massive place. It's got right. a, it's got a long hallway. It's got you know in uh, an arched opening. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got it, an ATM. It's got an ATM. Yeah. It's got a, there's a subway. It's got everything. <laughs> oh, it's so dumb. Oh. So, um, but it, it's it's a small part of kind of this <laughs> these these wild, fantastical, idealized landscapes that pop up all over in these neoclassical right. paintings. But this is not a landscape. This but is an interior. Interior. I mean, architectural. Don't think just because I was laughing, I can't go pedantic. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're, already, you're always ready to pull that trigger. Right. We need to, we should, we got to move on to, to other uh, more specific things. Definitely. Right? Okay. So we got a number of tensions here, don't we? We, we have do. to talk about them. We do. So we have this tension, uh, I think, between kind of the idealization of the classical hero. Uh, I mean, clearly, I think, uh, as David paints Socrates right. and these men in the Oath of, of the Horatii, these are men you want to emulate. Right. right? You want the to... light is shining on them in the center. Yes. They're bold. They're about to do something courageous for everyone's sake. Exactly. So there's a, there's a, there's a timelessness to it, right, that, that you can, can hope to embody. But you there's a tension between that and the romantic view of these of these ruins like the parthenon is a, is a great monument to these these wonderful ideals but look it's it's falling apart right these people are gone memento mori memento mori mm-hmm. right and the second tension we could describe as a return to simplicity yes um and so those the, the sleek uh, lines of a of a geometric temple the basics of a greco roman building 
at tension with these kind of more fantastical elements. When you see the neoclassical painters in particular paint these interiors and these buildings and reimagining the you know what downtown you know the Forum in Rome the Agra looked like. Uh, their imaginings are wild, and right. they're anything but simple. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, how do these things hold together? Right. And in some ways, you know, we're putting this this term neoclassicism um, in years, you know, well beyond this, and we're trying to kind of uh, impose a, a kind of order on something that maybe wasn't all that well ordered as it was going through it. So we should expect tensions. It's not a cohesive movement. No, only in hindsight can you pick out the thematic elements. Right. Right. But I think before we we turn to these monuments in Washington D.C., we have to talk about this this famous statue, the enthroned Washington, the Horatio Greenow. <laughs> right, exactly, right. Which I find unintentionally hilarious. This is 1840, right? And you don't like it. I do not like it. Okay, I do not like it. I, tell, I, tell us why. And I don't know a, a ton about George Washington himself, but my sense is that he wouldn't have liked this. Probably not. Right. The man seldom smiled. Right. Either to cover up bad teeth or from just a sense of decorum and stoicism. Right. So I, I, maybe he, I think he would have been embarrassed by it, uh, but maybe would have appreciated the sentiment. He's got the heroic torso. He does. So this 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 statue, it, it's a shirtless Washington. Where is it? it? Well, it's been moved around. It was originally intended it was going to sit in the rotunda uh, of the Capitol, uh, kind of pointing uh, right towards the, the dome of the rotunda, where there is a painting of the apotheosis That's of Washington. That's correct. Was Washington becoming a, a god. That's and, right. Right. Painted on the interior of the dome. Right. So we have we have Washington in this pose. He looks a lot like Socrates in David's painting. He's got his 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 finger raised. He's got kind of a cut, um, you know, a godlike torso. Yeah, the three four percent body fat. Right. He's got a, it's is that a kind of a Roman sword in his in in his left hand. Mm -hmm. um, but he's he's dressed like a I don't know, some kind of combination between a um, well. Kind of a philosopher and a statesman. A statesman, right. yeah. But he has noticeably George Washington hair. Yes, right. The hair is of the time. Right. He, he's kind of got that that frowny face that I always associate with George Washington. Mm -hmm. Right. He just regrets about the cherry tree. Right. And and but the according to the surviving histories of reactions, is a lot of people were uncomfortable with the statue. Not a lot of people wanted to see kind of a half naked George Washington. And so it was moved from the rotunda, and it was moved outside onto the east lawn of the Capitol. People didn't like it there. It got shuffled around, it, and, uh, and today you can find it on the second floor of the National Museum of American History, one of the mm. Smithsonian mm -hmm. museums. Mm -hmm. um, Shall I read the Latin on the inscription? Yeah, please do. Okay, so it says, Simulacrum istud ad magdalen libertatis exemplum, nec sine ipsa du raturdum Horatius Greenau faci ebat. Which translates to what? What does that? What does that mean? Well, something along the lines of this is not my translation, but Horatio Greenow made this image as a great example of freedom, which will not survive without freedom itself. Okay, all right, yeah, that's not bad. Um, Has this one been torn down? The statue? No, because it's in the. Um, you know, there was some defacing of statues and vandalizing of statues, and right. Such, but this was safe within the museum. Yeah. Yeah. But you would rather they drag this out and destroy it? No, not at all. No, no, no. Keep it right there where it is. I think I think it's a fascinating I'm being document. I'm being facetious. Right, right. Yes, but... I, I know. I know. Well, I think what's interesting is that this, so Greenow uh, sculpts this in 1840, which is right at the tail end of this romantic uh, kind of revival movement. I wonder if that explains part of the reaction to it. People saw, by this point, like, have we had enough of this already? Right, time it, to move on. Time to move on. This is a little too much. And so um, I just find it I just find it really kind of semi hilarious that it, it keeps getting bounced around and moved from place to place. Right. Speaking of bounced around and moved from place to place, yes. Let's insert some ads here. Let's do it. This episode of Ad Nauseum is brought to you by Racial Coffee from Portland, Oregon. Mark Helweg and his crack team of designers and manufacturers have produced the ultimate home coffee machine. Jeff, tell us about your Ratio 6. I love my Ratio 6. I use it every single morning. It's a sleek machine. It's beautiful to look at. I love the heavy weight of the carafe, which keeps my coffee warm for hours without any need of kind of any scorch pad underneath it. Mm -hmm. Can't say enough about it. My wife loves it every morning. I know that uh, if I got a difficult day to, that I'm facing, I know at least I'm going to start with a great cup of coffee. Exactly. And you've got the 8. I've got the Ratio 8. I used it this morning on my way to work. I, I brewed up uh, half a pot. And uh, I used some gift coffee I had received. I put it into the cone and I poured the water in. I pushed the button. It went through the three stages, the 
the bloom, right? Yes. Then the brew. Then the brew. Then the ready. Then the ready. Yeah, with the LED light that moves across. So reliable. You know, in the old days when I used one of those squirty plastic machines, I thought to myself, this could be hit or miss. Mm-hmm. It's probably going to be charred. Kind of smoky flavor. Who Burnt. Wants, yes. yes. Who yeah. wants that? No. Call? You can't drink it later. I come home after doing my teaching and other things, and there in the carafe, the coffee is still warm. Yes. Even if I have to reheat it a little bit, if it's been too long, it hasn't gone bitter and sour from yeah. sitting there. It's well preserved. Exactly. Exactly right. Yeah. No, this is the first machine I have ever owned that has done exactly that. Everything else has, has, has disappointed. Right. I got some stuff from the, I was looking at their website. Yes, that's and good. And I thought, um, it, you know, what exactly is the difference between the eight and the six? Okay, let's and, hear it. So they write, the eight was designed to- uh, auto- Other than- Other than- The best kind of people have the eight. Is that what it is? That what it is? That's what it exactly. is. Oh, that, that, that's right. It's in the fine print here. Okay. <laughs> the eight was designed to automate many of the variables that can make the pour over process tedious. Right. While still celebrating the kinesthetic experience of watching, hearing, and absorbing the beautiful aromas of coffee as mm, it's brewing. Right. Yes. Because it's an automatic pour over machine. Yes. It takes all the difficulty out of it. Yes. Uh, in early 2020, Racial Coffee released the six, designed to offer the one button convenience of its bigger sibling with a leaner form and a lighter price. Mm-hmm. It's a totally enclosed flat bottom filter system, which offers a bit more consistency than a cone shaped brewer and a more even extraction. That's not to say it's any better than the conical method. It isn't. It's another option. They like options. Right. Yeah. And, and in addition, you know, we should say, you know, this is not the kind of coffee machine you pick up for 25 bucks. No. So when you first look at the price, some people might say, yeah, that much for a coffee machine? But do the math, right? It's the one thing that you use practically every day. Mm-hmm. I have appliances in my garage I hardly ever use, right? Yeah. I'm using this coffee machine all the time. All the time. And it's it's pretty much an heirloom. You know, it's, it's going to last an extraordinarily long time, a couple time. decades. Right. And the, the quality of coffee that it, that it produces... It's better than the, the stuff that I picked up at the at the the, the, the brew bean at the barn. bargain barn. That's right. It's exactly. astounding. So, right. uh, listener, to support this program and to get yourself a great cup of coffee, we humbly ask you to go to ratiocoffee.com, r a t i o coffee.com, and check out the six and the eight. We've got a special coupon code, which is A N C O. You punch that in, and what do they get? You get fifteen percent off the ratio six or the ratio eight. And uh, you all have been really responding to this. So this has been a, a good partnership for us with Mark. And uh, we're just really pleased with the support that you all have been showing for this program. Yes, a big thanks. So check it out today. This episode of Adazium also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. Hackett Publishing based in Indianapolis and Cambridge. They have been producing high quality, affordable, erudite text translations uh, from classical works to all other corners of the humanities for the last 40 years. Um, Dave has used them. I've used them. I have them on my home shelf. I have them in my office. Um, I love Hackett Publishing. Uh, Dave, what are some of the things you like about Hackett? Well, in my teaching this semester, I was teaching a course on the great works of the Middle Ages. Hmm. And, uh, you know, I read avidly in a number of different areas, but I'm not an expert in everything, obviously. And uh, if you're listening to this podcast, you know that. (laughs) And uh, so I needed some texts. I needed Boethius, Consolation of Philosophy. And I thought to myself, I'll bet Hackett has an excellent text. And I wasn't I wasn't wrong. I went to the site, checked it out, and it's a very good translation of Boethius. Uh, I picked up a lot of other things. You know, they have uh, several translations of the Republic. We've been using the Ovid texts. Yes. The one by Lombardo and also Z. Philip Ambrose. That's right. Great stuff. Let's face it, Hackett has pretty much everything you could want. For your home library, if you're a teacher, if you're a student of the classics, you really need to see what they have on offer. That's right. Um, so check out their, their website, hackettpublishing.com. Um, I was looking at it as, as just today. They've actually started hosting um, author talks. Mm. So um, the, uh, Joel Relihan, um, by the time this episode airs, will have, have passed, but um, they have him on talking about his translation of, of Lucian. Right. And so the, the website's worth checking out anyway. They've got more going on than just selling books. Definitely. Yeah. So go there, hackettpublishing.com, mm-hmm. H-A-C-K-E-T-T, publishing.com. Pick out a selection of books that you like. Put them in your little lunch pail or your picnic basket, whatever yes. it is, and then you're going to want to use a coupon code at checkout. Yes, A N two zero two one. A N two zero two one. Yep, and that will get you twenty percent off on your 20, whole order. Twenty percent. It's huge. That's Not, incredible. But it doesn't stop there. It's okay. also free shipping. Free shipping. Check it out today. 
This episode also brought to you by the Moss Method. Dave, tell us about the Moss Method. Moss Method for Greek is a program that I have developed that will allow you to go from a neophyte to erudite. Now, what does that even mean? It means that you can start out with little or no knowledge of Greek. Okay. And in a set amount of time, through careful study and guidance, with my help, you can learn a great deal about the Greek language. You can read Homer, Plato, Demosthenes, Aristotle, Xenophon, Aristophanes. The New Testament in Greek. That, sound, that, that sounds great. It's achievable. You can do it. I've been teaching Greek and studying Greek for almost 30 years. When I started out, I knew nothing, and I wasn't a very good student, frankly. So how did I get to this place where I can read and study Greek with pleasure and sometimes ease? Well, it was a lot of work, right? And a lot of good teaching that I've had. I've taken all that work and instruction, the things I've learned over the years, and I've compressed and boiled it down into this program. This sounds great. So if somebody wanted to take advantage of this, what would they have to do? They've got to first go to mossmethod.com, watch the free Greek instruction. I've got a lot of it. Check out the free videos. Uh, see what the program offers, the four modules. And then they have to keep their eyes peeled. Uh, for what? For the Blafry Monsai. The Blafry Monsai? You don't remember Blafry Monsai? No, what is this? From calendar year 2020? This is some kind of special offer, I think. This is the Black Friday Monday Cyber I had to reverse them. <laughs> so it would rhyme? In a kind of chiasmus so that it would rhyme. It's the Black Friday Monsai. Black Friday Monsai. And so what do they get if they take advantage of The Black of Friday Monday Cyber uh, will begin on November 20. Okay. November 20. And if you go, you're going to get a special bargain, the precise number of which I haven't even decided yet. This is how crazy this deal is going to be. You, you sound like one of these these kind of these crazy used car salesmen who are like, you know. Uh, you know, Jeff, I'm yeah. offended. Obs what? I'm offended at this point. No, I like those guys. You okay? <laughs> First of all, I'm se I'm selling a primo product. Oh yes, all right. I, I didn't, I'm not giving away any donuts I, I or <laughs> pinstriping or balloons or <laughs> boiled hot dogs. I never meant to imply such. Please carry on. Okay. Okay. That's pretty much it. That's it. Go to mossmethod.com and check out the Greek program I have to go from neophyte to erudite. <laughs> All right, Jeff, as we resume here, we're going to take a look at the Washington Monument. Right. That's going to be our first example of, of neoclassicism, which is might strike the listener as a bit strange. The Washington Monument is a uh, an Egyptian-style obelisk. It is an obelisk. So how would that fit in with a Greek revival, a neoclassical movement? Uh, Dave, do you have an answer for that? I mean, why this weird obelisk um, in a sea of Greek temples? Mm -hmm. I do have an answer for that. Okay, please, well, offer it. So here in the early part of the reign of Augustus, so this is Octavian, right, who replaced Julius Caesar, his adopted father, was actually his great uncle, going a little deep maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, Augustus said, I want to beatify Rome. I want to take it from a city of mud and brick and turn it into a city of marble. That's right. So he brings back from Egypt, after the conquest over Cleopatra, a number of Egyptian antiquities. Yes. Giant granite obelisks. And he decorates all of Rome with these. There are some very impressive ones, one of which stands now in the Piazza di San Pietro in front of the Vatican. That's right. It's yes. a big one at the base of which, according to legend, uh, the Apostle Peter was crucified upside down. Right. Um, this was an obelisk that once stood uh, on the, the spine of what was Nero's Circus. Correct. Where we believe Peter was indeed martyred. Right? That's right. Right. Which is the subject of another episode. Which we will not. <laughs> which we will not refer to. No. No. But that's what an obelisk is. It's a giant granite um, barbecue skewer. <laughs> exactly. Barbecue right. skewer, I say. Yes. Yeah. So where does this come from? Well, it comes from a Greek word, obeliskos. Obeliskos, which is a diminutive of obelos. And an obeliskos is a long, extended, you know, sharpened, thin piece of metal that looks exactly like a barbecue skewer. When the Greeks came to Egypt and they saw all of the wonders there, with typical Greek audacity and chauvinism, they said, we got those at home, that giant granite monument piercing the sky, mm. right? Its horn pierces the sky. They said, we got those at home. That's just a little barbecue skewer, an obeliskos. So they gave it a deliberately uh, pejorative and belittling name. They were, they were poo-pooing it. That's right. Interesting. Now, from what I've read about, about this, um, so from what you were just talking about, you seem to imply that the setting up of an obelisk is, in some ways, even though it's an Egyptian thing, it's meant to echo Augustine. 
Augustus, sorry, yes. uh, in, in Rome. Hallowed antiquity. Became Hall- associated with Roman power. Right. Now, from what I've read, um, it's been explained, well, the, the monument is an obelisk because there was also, as part of this Greek revival, kind of an, an Egyptomania. Mm-hmm. Uh, you have Napoleon, uh, uh, you know, taking his army down there and... And you know, le- the legend has it right. not true that you know, firing the cannons at the Sphinx and right. and stuff like that. And so that was also kind of part of this frenzy. And so an obelisk would be part uh, of of this of this interest in antiquities as belonging to ancient Egypt. And the height of the Washington Monument is just slightly higher than the Great Pyramid of Giza. Oh, is that right? Correct. It's a little bit higher to so to show that see we outdid those ancient Egyptians. Oh, so the the the, the column itself. Is 500 feet, and then the, the little uh, pyramid on top is another 55 feet. Mm-hmm. So that's just higher than the... Just a little... The Washington Monument is just a little bit higher than that. Casts a somewhat longer shadow. And speaking of Egyptomania, yeah. this struck again in the late 80s, if I'm not mistaken, with the band The Bangles. Oh, with the walk like an Egyptian. That's right. <laughs> it wasn't as long-lived. <laughs> no. And didn't result in any works of architecture. No, that, but that that song was ubiquitous. For, yes. For, and it was everywhere. Yeah, well, both of those things. Did you walk like an Egyptian? <laughs> I might have struck the pose a couple of times, but then quickly, you know, I saw myself in the mirror and said, no, this is this is mm-hmm. unacceptable. Yeah. Right? yeah. I was doing a lot of contrapasto. Contra, uh, to that song? Yes. Because I'm going to walk like an Egyptian. <laughs> Strictly Greek. Right. Uh, hot take. Terrible song. Okay. All right. I didn't ask for it. Okay, but... Glad to have it. <laughs> but you hate all all songs. That's not true. That's right. I just have a, um, a shorter list than you do. So, yeah. So, uh, I mean, you talk about you know, Augustus um, wanting to turn Rome from a city of brick to city of marble. I think he's building upon you know, plans that Caesar had. Uh, Caesar had gone to Alexandria and saw, oh my gosh, this is how a city They're should be. They're way ahead of us. Way ahead of us, right? Right. We, yes. we rule the world, but the place looks like a dump. Right. So they wanted to bring up a, a bit of that, um, well, that Hellenistic, Hellenistic Egypt mm-hmm. uh, back to back to Rome, like Lord Elgin. Ex- exactly right. So the obelisk, I think it's it's referring to a number of these things. You can see it referring as to kind of you know, deep uh, uh, Egyptian antiquity. It refers to kind of uh, an Alexandrian uh, yes. Egypt, and then also kind of a, a Roman appropriation of Egypt. All of those things happening at the same time. So mm-hmm. it's a it's a multi layered uh, symbol. So what can you find in Rome today in terms of obelisks? There are thirteen obelisks, and I've okay. seen them all. Have you seen them all? Yeah, I don't Have believe you collected so. them all before your friends. I don't think so. No, uh, there are uh, eight that were taken from Egypt, and imagine what that what that must have been to take these multi-ton objects and Huge. put them on ships. And Incredible. It, what, what a feat in and of itself. Of course, the ships of the day were much larger than we typically imagine. Josephus mentions uh, a grain barge that traveled from Alexandria to Rome, mm-hmm. right? That was a common route. And there were 600 passengers. Oh, my goodness. That's a cruise ship. That's right. Now, they were stuffed on the deck, I'm sure, in all kinds of uncomfortable ways. Right. But it takes a lot of space to fit 600 people, no matter where you put them. Very true. Very true. That's a massive boat. Right. So this boat would have been just a cargo boat, the Mm -hmm. one that brought the obelisk. But the the technological and engineering difficulties in moving that... Just to take it down. Tremendous. Yeah. So there's eight that were taken from Egypt and um, are still surviving in Rome, and then another five that the Romans themselves carved and, and set up, and they they decorate these wonderful little piazzas all over mm-hmm. all over that wonderful city. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So what were the original plans for the Washington Monument? The original plans were apparently uh, supposed to be a much more kind of neoclassical in that it would have a, a, a kind of a Greek look to it, and there was going to be this circular base of of Doric columns, and then the obelisk would rise out of the middle of it. And um, there were going to be statues of revolutionary war heroes, the signers of the Declaration hmm. inside that portico. All, all 56. All 56. Wow. And, and then 30 revolutionary war heroes. That, that would have been a very crowded portico. And then, of course, George himself, right? Yeah, he was going to be uh, driving a six-horse chariot. A six-horse chariot. Uh, over the top of the entrance of the portico. And you know he was, he was going to be shirtless. <laughs> That's two more horses than your typical quadriga. Right. It's right. like the ratio eight of chariots. <laughs> right, right, right. But I think uh, the uh, wisdom prevailed, and they decided to 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 do away with that circular base right. and just go with the unadorned obelisk. Something clean, something um, more linear. Yeah, yeah. Something yeah. more um, republican, right? That yeah. is fitting of a republic, right? Rather than signs of empire. Right, and I, I like to think that old George would have said, "Yeah, I, I, I go I, for I, that. I go for that." Right. Mm. Yeah. Still the tallest building in D.C., if it counts as a building? I guess so. I, okay. Yeah, I guess so. I, I think I read somewhere that there might be some um, you know, some statute where things aren't allowed to be built, built higher than the Washington mm. Monument. Have um, you been up the Washington Monument? When I was a kid. Yeah, I remember doing that. How okay. about you? No, and you've also been up the... Um, 
the arch in St. Louis, right? Yes. Right. Yeah, that, that weird kind of clunk, clunky elevator that mm-hmm. takes you to the top. And you've been up inside Trajan's Column, which yep. almost nobody gets to do that. One of the highlights of my life, mm-hmm. yes. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that on another episode. Right. So, yeah. I've never been in any of those structures. Right. So it reminds me of how um, my wife once summed up uh, kind of our, our trip to to Italy. Yes. Places was, she said, well, what, you know, what, how was it there? I said, well, we did a lot of um, seeing dead people and climbing tall things. <laughs> <laughs> well said. <laughs> yes. Jefferson Memorial. Right. So moving on. So the, the Washington Monument was built in the middle part of the 19th century, uh, kind of towards the, the end of this, this first Greek revival. The Jefferson Memorial uh, was built uh, much later. It was built in, in 1939 and only took four years to, to put up, 1939 to 1943. So built during the uh, FDR's um, administration. And kind of right in the heart of the Depression and World War II, which I find kind of interesting mm. that um, this, this this kind of project, which cost millions and millions of dollars, would go up at, at such a at such a time as that. Well, of course, there's a lot of extravagant building at the end of the Pentecontitia, right? When Pericles and uh, Sparta are you know going to war. Mm-hmm. Athens, well, that's true. Athens' building project doesn't halt. Yeah. No, that's... You got you to keep building great stuff, even when you're threatened externally, because you got you got to convince the people we're going to win this thing. Right. No, that's that's a nice corollary too. Right. Exactly. Though, so it's uh, not so... necessarily in times of peace and and when you're flush with cash, this stuff comes up. It's in times of of, uh, of trial. Right. Yeah. I wouldn't necessarily have wanted to be a taxpayer in either set <laughs> in either setting. I would have said you're building that, but yeah, hindsight. Right. 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 So um, you know, we were talking earlier in the in the program about how. Uh, a lot of I think contemporary or, or um, um, general knowledge about about antiquity is filtered through these neoclassical monuments. I think one of the the, the, the things that that speaks to this is this the bright white monochromatic nature of the, mm-hmm. the Jefferson Memorial, the Lincoln Memorial, the Washington Monument, the Supreme Court Building. Um, whereas we know uh, that these actual temples in antiquity were highly decorated and colored, right? Covered in pinks and blues and greens and gold leaf and silver leaf to a degree that probably if we were to see them in all their glory, uh, we would consider it to be in, in bad taste. We might even say it's garish. Garish, right. So if, you, if you've been to, to the British Museum, as I know you have, mm-hmm. you can still see the flecks of a red and blue paint on some aspects of the decoration of the Parthenon Yes, for the marbles that are there. And it's shocking the first time you encounter it if you have this monochromatic view. Right. And so we're, we're so used to thinking of these monuments as kind of that, that, that uh, you know, the mellow gold kind of you know, dappled in the setting sun um, or the kind of the bright white marble in these kinds of monuments mm-hmm. that um, it's a, again, it's a, it's a bit misleading. Right. Yeah. Bright primary colors. Right. So Thomas Jefferson himself, an accomplished architect mm-hmm. and uh, down at Monticello, loved domes. He loved domes. Couldn't right. get enough of domes. Mm-hmm. He was a dome guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so Jefferson, a, a polymath, you know, had his fingers in lots of different things, but right. designed his own his own home, you know, Monticello. Yes. And which has a dome. Right. And his monument there. Uh, I've been inside that. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. It's a mini Pantheon, right? right? It's just basically the Pantheon without some of the polish, we could say. Yeah, exactly. And it's a, a the main the rotunda is a it's an open portico. It's not an enclosed building right. like, like the Pantheon is, and it doesn't have an oculus at the top. Um, uh, one of my favorite things about the Pantheon in Rome is that it has this open eye that rain and right. the occasional snow. Can it's incredible. It's incredible, right? But that's uh, that hole is plugged in in uh, in Jefferson's monument, mm-hmm. but. Um, uh, that you know, so you know, I, as I was reading, this was this design was chosen for this monument because Jefferson himself seemed to have been such a uh, an admirer of the Pantheon, right? You know, incorporated so, into his house, and then the, mm-hmm. the um, at the University of Virginia also has right. a, has a, a domed facade, gorgeous campus, yeah, oh, beautiful, yeah. So John Russell Pope won the design competition, right, mm-hmm. for the uh, the Jefferson Memorial, but there was a little bit of competition, wasn't there, before that, as to uh, whether there was going to be something in Teddy Roosevelt's honor, right? So in the twenties, apparently they were uh, there was a push to have a, a monument to Teddy. How do you feel about Teddy? Uh, I don't know a ton about Teddy. I know you know he's the Rough Rider, um, not a fan, bully. You know, national parks guy, right? Yeah. So I, I don't know a ton of. I, I admit ignorance, but you're not a fan of Teddy. One of, one of my least favorite. The least favorite. One of my least favorite presidents. Wow, man. Constantly quoting scripture uh, in public and in private. Uh, a knowledgeable man. I don't really like his ideas. 
Really? Mm-hmm. Okay. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Sure. I don't know much, much about that. So you're kind of happy maybe that he didn't get his money. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. So this that, that whole thing uh, fell through, but apparently they were going to do a, uh, a monument to him on the Tidal Basin mm-hmm. where the Jefferson mon- Monument is. Um, FDR comes along. He's a great admirer of, of Jefferson and says, well, let's push for a memorial, but let's, right. let's do it to TJ. Let's switch it. Not let's... to my cousin, right? Right. Teddy oh, right. was his cousin, right, but let's right. give it to TJ. So 54 ionic columns. Mm-hmm. And an open air circular chamber. Yes, um, the, my my favorite columns, those ionic columns. Yes, you know? and a bronze statue of Jefferson on a pedestal. Right, and I like the choice for that. If that um, you see the bronze statue of Jefferson, he's dressed. It's a. Uh, it's idealized, but it's realistic. Mm-hmm. He's dressed in... No heroic torso. No. <laughs> he's dressed in 18th, 19th century je- dress. He's got a shirt on. Yeah. So I think they learned their lesson. Nobody wants to see a shirtless uh, Thomas. No. <laughs> well, we're starting to wrap up here, Jeff, aren't we? We are. And uh, we could talk about possibly the most beautiful Greek temple ever built. Which is? The Lincoln Memorial. Oh. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I think we should put that off for another time. That, maybe that deserves its kind of its own corner. Yes. Yeah. I learned one interesting uh, thing about it today from uh, my daughter, Yeah, uh, which is that some people think Lincoln's hands in the statue are sign language uh, for AL. I have heard that. Is that not He's, true? I don't know. Oh, yeah. I guess uh, experts are somewhat divided. I have heard that as well. So he's kind of giving his own initials there in, in his in his hands, kind of his Zeus on the throne. Right. Yeah. So here is how I have been ruined once again by pop culture, because yeah. all I can think of when I think of that statue is that Planet of the Apes movie with uh, Mark Wahlberg. And instead of Lincoln, there is some ape sitting on his thrown there in the monument. Oh, I completely forgot about the that. The memorial. You haven't seen that? I think we actually watched that together. That could be. Yeah, yeah. Block that whole thing out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would ruin it. It's terrible. It's terrible. Right? So we're going to skip. We're going to skip the Lincoln Memorial. Yeah. We're going to wrap it up with the Supreme Court building. Right. So this building was built right around the same time, uh, just before actually the, the Jefferson Memorial. Uh, again, right in the heart of the Depression, 1932 uh, to 1935. And it was envisioned, it was designed as a kind of grand temple of justice. Mm-hmm. And so um, some of the statuary out there is meant to... Um, uh, echo uh, the Roman Eustitia, right? Uh, the, the the blind justice holding the scales. Um, well, are... if you want to convince the population that you got this all under control, spend a lot of money on something that's not necessary. Right, right, <laughs> exactly, right, right. Look, we got this. We'll we... make it through. See, we can even build this monument. Exactly, everything's fine. Right. What are you worried about? Yeah, dust bowl, sh- sh- must bowl, something <laughs> like that. Um, I thought I found this was interesting. So Taft. Mm-hmm. Um, um, how do you feel about Taft as a person? This is the bathtub Taft, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, the, the large... The fellow who was stuck in the bathtub. <laughs> right, Poor, exactly. guy. Poor guy. But, I mean, he was uh, the only president who was also a uh, Supreme Court uh, mm-hmm. justice, right? right. And um, he was the one who actually, uh, this is after his presidency, he, he says, look, we need our own space. Um, the Supreme Court's been meeting in the old Senate chamber. Uh, we're an equal branch of justice, but we don't have our own building. Occasionally in the mop room right, right. of the White House. <laughs> right, exactly. Right. Um, this can't. This can't go on. And so he really pushed for you know this. Uh, and I think he was right. It needs its own space. Um, and so the result was this grand temple, uh, which was also roundly criticized uh, after it was complete. Um, probably of the you know the three things we're talking about: the Jefferson Memorial, the Washington Monument, and the, the this building. This is by far the most ornate. Oh. Um, and it kind of gets closer to that more, more Baroque style. Mm-hmm. The columns on the front are the Corinthian yes. uh, style. It has a large plaza with fountains. That's not really in keeping with the severity of justice. No, it's not. And I think that's law. a lot of people were, were, kind of, were put off by that. Hmm. Two pediments, right? Two pediments. So, so it's, it's, a, it's not just the facade. It's got a front and a, and a, and a back, mm-hmm. you know, just like a... Like the Parthenon. Like the Parthenon. On an east-west axis. Yep. And so the east pediment has a, um, a statue group called Justice, the Guardian of Liberty, the west pediment equal justice under the under the law there are flanking statues uh on the and the the main entrance of uh that that echo the roman justitia uh the, the called the authority of law and the contemplation of justice so it's filled with all of these again, classical illusions but it, it's in that over the top kind of idealized uh almost fantastical right. um neoclassical style early reactions to the building uh, not favorable. Okay. Right. So, uh, a, a lot of people, um, took offense, uh, at its, uh, kind of the over the topness of right. it. So, um, for example, Justin Harlan, uh, just, Fis- justice, ju- yes, Justin, justice, Harlan Fiststone, 
uh, complained that it was almost bombastically pretentious, wholly inappropriate for a quiet group of old boys such as the Supreme Court. <laughs> I thought that was great. Um, another justice observed that he felt the court would be nine black beetles in the temple of Karnak. What in the world does that mean? I, think, I mean, it's a, re- a reference to that that massive temple in the uh, in, in the south of Egypt along, okay. along the Nile. He just thought it was kind of so. In these black robes, are just like beetles, beetles scuttling around in this mm. giant temple. Mm. Um, uh, another complained that such pomp and ceremony suggested that uh, the justices ought to enter the courtroom riding on elephants. <laughs> <laughs> like that. This is maybe the best one. The New Yorker columnist uh, Howard Brubaker yes. noted at the time of its opening that it had quote fine big windows to throw the New Deal out of. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's brilliant. That's right. Yeah. If you only get one great line your whole life, yeah. that should be it, right? I'm sure Brubaker said some other interesting things, but that's it. That's gold. It is. It's great. That is gold. So yeah, so there's have you been inside that building? No. I have I have not either. Um uh, I've mean, I've walked through that plaza and it is it is very much kind of over the top. And I Re- remember when I said last time this this podcast is not about my ignorance of pop culture. Yeah. This podcast is also not about the buildings I haven't entered. Okay. All right. So that's that's my cue to let this thing go. Okay. Let it go. All right. Well, hey, the clock on the wall is telling us we got to get out of here. Yes, we do. So before we do so, we got to thank some people. Thanks to Mishka, our intrepid engineer, uh, for the great work she does week in, week out. Puts uh, it all together so nicely. What about these great musicians, Dave? Yes. Ken Tamplin with the screaming guitar solo and... Uh, the great bumper music for our ads, and Scott Van Zen, who's got a new album called Trouble coming out. This guy can play like Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yes, and Eddie Van Halen all rolled into one. That's wonderful. Uh, we 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 love to hear from you, listeners. So uh, keep the the comments, the the notes coming in. If you want to write to us, uh, write to Dave at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. And if you want to contact Jeff, Jeff at adnauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Virtually every week, we receive multiple emails from you. The loyal and quite engaging fans, I have to say. Yes, we we love reading it. Um, uh, yeah, keep it coming. I think that this episode was actually suggested by a listener. Is that right? Yeah, who said, let's do some architecture. That Excellent. Yes. Great. So, so we're real thankful for that. Yes. And next week, a topic to be announced? No, we got one. We got, what's one? We're not t- reading the script? No, what are we talking about? Oh, we're going to take a look at one book. One book. One book. Yes. It's called The First Thousand Words in Latin. Are we going to look at all 1,000 of them? No. Okay. <laughs> it's put together by Heather Amory and uh, our friend, Dr. Patrick Owens, yeah. collaborated extensively on this book. It's published by Usborne. These are known as the duck books. Okay. So on every page, there's buried a little tiny yellow duck. Oh, I like that. Yeah. So like, what, like a little hidden picture? That's right. Nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of the more interesting finds from the first thousand words in Latin, and we're going to suggest some ways that you might use them, whether you are a Latinist or not. Sounds great. And Jeff, you have the gustatory parting shot. Yes, this comes from the great Douglas Adams, author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, who once said, it is a mistake to think you can solve any major problems just with potatoes. Yeah. That's surrealism, isn't it? It is. I like it. You like the surrealism? I, do. I like the weird. All right. So we got to say, uh, we saved one little last thing. We do. What's that? Yeah. Well, we have a special guest who's going to say goodbye to our audience, and here she is. This is Flannery from Austin. Thanks for listening to the Ad Nauseam Podcast. 